Okay, we're back. We're live. This is Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. Uh, the handsome young man on the screen is Peter Hoffenberg. And our esteemed guest is Tamara Albertini of the um, UH, what, History Department? Did I get that right? Philosophy. 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 Okay. You, know, you know, I always thought that philosophy was more important than history, but that's just me. And I would never oh, yeah. admit that to Peter either. Right, I'm leaving now. The, the handsome guy is going. <laughs> Thank you. Now the non-handsome guy will return. So we're going to talk about the Crusades and their effect on modern day Middle East and Central Asia. Um, very important because we need to connect the dots and understand about how history is here to help. Peter, can you please give us a proper introduction for uh, Tamara Abatini? It's a, it's a great pleasure. Uh, Dr. Abatini is one of the real jewels of UH Manoa. Uh, her expertise is, goes beyond uh, Islamic uh, philosophy. I suppose that's what the certificate probably says. Uh, she's chair of the philosophy department. She's an expert not just in Islamic philosophy, but also the Renaissance era, well-versed in ancient Western uh, philosophy. And she's been on hand for the last several years to contribute to a, a meaningful discussion across what is off, often seems to be an absurd division between East and West. She's been very helpful to students and faculty to get us to understand Islamic and Muslim history and philosophy and to understand its important uh, connections. Uh, this is not to whitewash difficulties and she confronts the difficulties, uh, but she confronts them with integrity and asks us really to, to know what is often simply called the East uh, and rather than just fall prey to those presumptions. So I'd like to turn it over to her. Uh, and Jay will have some questions about Trying to oh, I'll have some questions yeah. right okay. now. Right. You know, we That's just had a show, um, you know, uh, commemorating 9-11. And um, probably the best um, recent documentary I've seen is the one called uh, uh, Turning Point, which examines uh, world history for 20 years before 9-11 and, of course, world history for 20 years after 9-11. Uh, and the question I would put to you, uh, given, you know, your academic interest in the subject is, what are your reactions 20 years after 9-11, you know, in terms of the effect of the Crusades and the relationship between East and West? Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for um, inviting me. Uh, Jay, thank you for the beautiful and entirely undeserved introduction that uh, Peter gave me here. Um, yes, 9-11 um, has been a turning point in many ways. And 9-11 is actually what helped me understand from where came all that language having to do with um, modern crusaders that is um, widely spread in, in some publications and on many websites um, in the Islamic world. You see, I grew up in Tunisia, in North Africa. I went there to school, public schools, until the age of 14. And I don't recall anyone ever mentioned the Crusades. Our history teacher brought it up, and, and that was something of the past. But then um, when 9-11 started, I realized that whatever I happen to know about the past of uh, Islam, its history, its religion, its philosophy, uh, really mattered today. And um, I start to look more and more at the fundamentalist language that um, you know, was being disseminated all over the internet. And I was intrigued by it. I was trying to understand why, why this return to presumably something very pristine. And to keep it short, I mean, what I did understand after a while is that um, the masterminds of Islamic fundamentalism, I'm talking about the aggressive sort, the terrorist sort, um, like to give themselves the appearance of being scholarly and of respecting the principles of Islamic theology. But then as soon as you started digging, you would find that they were masters at manipulating classical Islamic theology. They, they knew how to make things look good, um, although they were actually against um, the principles of, of Islam. And in that context, I start to see more and more texts referring to the West as crusaders and to Jews generally as Zionists. And it was very much about the, um, the cooperation between modern crusaders and Zionists. And I was wondering for a long time, 
um, why is the language of the Crusaders so important today? Um, because if you look at um, his, historic sources, Islamic historic sources, once Jerusalem was back in Islamic hands and the Crusaders didn't come up uh, the, uh, to the Holy Land, didn't come to the Holy Land anymore, Islamic historians are actually mostly silent, silent about uh, the Crusades. Uh, they won, the Crusaders didn't come back, and that's all that mattered, right? And then I found out that um, the, the names associated with modern Crusades were the military leaders who captured Jerusalem at the beginning of the 20th century. So we're talking here about British General Allenby, who entered Jerusalem in 1917, we are talking about a French commander, um, uh, Henri Gouraud, uh, and uh, they made very strange comments, strange from our perspective, but very revealing for where they stood and how they looked at history. I mean, a very famous statement that General Allenby made was, and this, this is the wording, the war of the Crusades is now, the wars of the Crusades are now complete. I mean, goodness. This is what, over 600 years after the last crusades. And that's the first thing that comes to mind <laughs> when entering <laughs> Jerusalem, right? Uh, and then um, uh, the French commander, right, said uh, apparently um, the, cru the, the crusades have ended now. Awake Saladin, right? The famous leader Salah ad din who, who um, you know, um, uh, conquered Jerusalem and so forth. So um, these type of statements were repeated and repeated and disseminated. And uh, basically, most of the European press used this as titles on their first pages, right? And that's something that I think Europeans have forgotten, right? But um, um, modern day Arabs and Muslims more, more generally um, were kind of intrigued by these statements. And then there is a whole thing about, you know, the, the, the redesigning of the borders, uh, the Cycus Pico map and all of that. And I think that's the context where the language of the Crusades became again, very important as a way to um, um, protest, you know, I'm using a very weak word here to protest against what is considered to be um, uh, Western supremacy, European imperialism, neo-colonialism, and, and so forth, right? Um, and that is something I think that no one could have predicted, right? That, that the um, rather uh, misguided wars referred to as the Crusades in the Middle Ages came back in a very different setting and came to do a political job. So this is all about becoming uh, the tool of a new ideology. So that, in a nutshell, is where the Crusades fit in today in what we call the Middle East. How did it get baked in that way? I mean, we know that um, these people went from Europe to the Middle East and uh, they rode horses and they all looked like knights. And I guess they had a lot of people with shields and spears and they weren't out to help anyone. There was no soft power or smart power. Uh, I'm not sure what they were after, though, or what they achieved, probably nothing. Um, but they did alienate people. And I'm, I'm wondering, Tamara, that, you know, that alienation somehow stuck all these years and it got baked into the way people think in the Middle East, think about the Europeans for generation after generation, passed on down in the culture, uh, in the religion, of course, uh, in the literature, in, in, the, in the, um, the family table, if you will, that Europeans did bad things. But how, how, how it, it seems like it's lasting a long time. And is it question, question, um, is it really over? Right, I mean, you know, you, you look at uh, the fundamentalist press and it's not over. And, and I'm not saying that it is necessarily all, all erroneous and misguided. It's actually a call for us Western intellectuals and generally Western politicians to uh, wonder about that. It says something about how we're being perceived. And if, if that's how many um, modern day Muslims think of the West as kind of like neo-crusaders, 
well, we, we, we better change that as much as we can. Right? We, because I don't think that um, Europeans and, and Americans have any desire of being seen as crusaders. Uh, any, any decent person would recognize that uh, it was a mistake in the Middle Ages and there is no way to get it right uh, in any other setting, right? How it started in the Middle Ages, well, you see, the, you always have villains on every side. Um, so the, the villain from the Christian point of view, from the European point of view, was a Fatimid ruler. Um, there was a time when there was also a Shia kingdom that was very important, very powerful. Um, the Fatimids coming from the line of Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad, um, they were Shiites and they, they were uh, governing Egypt and much of what is today North Africa. And they were also controlling Jerusalem in the 10th, 11th centuries. Um, so one of the Fatimid rulers fancied himself a messianic figure. The, the Arabic term is Mehdi. He thought of himself as the Mehdi. Maybe he didn't believe it himself, but he surely knew how to depict himself as, as a messianic figure. So we're talking here about um, the Fatimid um, Caliph and Hakim. Um, he became enraged uh, with uh, Christians and Jews in Jerusalem, and not only in the city of Jerusalem. The story goes that a monk, so a Christian monk, had approached him and told him that that holy fire that is is said to appear uh, in the Eastern night in the church of the Holy Sepulchre was all a fraud and it was just a, a chemical thing and so forth. And so presumably that's what this Fatimid Caliph got um, angry about. And then he decided to destroy churches and synagogues and religious artifacts and Torah, Torahs were burned and so forth. So that is kind of like the villain now on the, on the Islamic side. And I must say he was really the exception. I'm not aware of any other rulers who were controlling uh, Jerusalem and the Holy Land who acted that way. Typically, pilgrims were allowed into the city and they even enjoyed some protection and, and so forth. So this is, this is a unique figure. Um, and now, naturally, um, the European powers of the day were um, infuriated by this news. Um, so the Church of the Holy Sepulchre was destroyed and so forth. And that's when the idea of uh, going to Jerusalem and, and recapturing the city and the holy sites um, became, became active. But, you know, interestingly, it took about 100 years before the first crusade was, was launched, right? So I'm, I always wonder, I mean, can you still be that angry 100 years later? But the fact is that that's always, right? The, 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 the reason that's being talked about, they destroyed our holy sites and we have to go back and, and try to prevent that. But you know, as it is with many wars, um, it, it, I think it was a way for Europe to export its, uh, its um, um, lower ranking aristocrats, the ones who were not going to inherit crowns and principalities and so forth. These guys had needed to have something to do. So, they were sent to the Holy Land, go back, get Jerusalem and what have you. And they did horrible things. Um, I, they... I, I really want to be in your class, Tamara. I hope you'll let me come around. <laughs> Just Anytime. <listen>. Anytime. <laughs> so a yeah. um, couple, couple of things. You, know, you mentioned earlier um, that, you know, that a part of uh, Islam had kind of uh, gone, gone, gone violent. And um, I wonder, the things you're talking about, the Crusades and, and the violence surrounding the Crusades, both sides. Um, it, um, is that a factor in the development of this, this split off Islam where uh, people in Islam are sort of in, incorporating violence into their approach, terrorism and the like? Um, the Crusades, the, the Crusades exacerbate that aspect of the religion? Um. The memory of the Crusades were brought back in recent days, in, or rather, let's say in something like the last 50 years. The memory of the Crusades was not something in the Islamic world. I mean, you know, highly trained historians, of course, knew about it and knew about the atrocities committed uh, by Christians against, against Muslims. Um, you look at the records and it's very clear that um, when, when the Christian army uh, entered Jerusalem, um, there was a bloodbath 
that was unheard of in that part of the world. I mean, the story goes that as the, the knights entered the city of Jerusalem on their horses, that their horses were wading in blood up to their knees. They killed indiscriminately everybody, including Christians, you know, Armenian Christians, any other Christians who lived in the holy city and who thought that, you know, they might be safe. Um, and that was a scale of brutality that, uh, that was new to, to a part of the world that in its long history had seen plenty of uh, horrible things happen. Um, and just to give you a contrast, when, when Muslims reconquered Jerusalem, you know, the famous Saladin, Salah al-Din, there was an agreement reached that the population, the Christian population could leave Jerusalem and even carry away some of their property and, and, and wealth, and that no one would be harmed. And Salah al-Din did honor that, right? And, and that's, that's something that today plays a role again because the events of the Crusades ha are, have found a new political context. It, it is um, obviously uh, a historic fact that it happened, that um, Muslims died by the thousands um, because of the Christian presence in, and we're talking here, European Christian presence. And there were always Christians in the Middle East, right? That these were outsiders, right? Um, because of how they conducted themselves in, in, in that part of the world. So again, it's, it's a rather new phenomenon, right? And, and I understand the background. I understand how that is symbolic, right? Of a position that is clearly being perceived as, uh, as imperialistic. Mm -hmm. Well, nobody likes anybody invading his country. No. <laughs> uh, Peter, Peter, your thoughts at this point and questions? Uh, my thoughts are from the other perspective, which is the Western perspective in order to have a dialogue and it's almost diametrically opposed. So for example, the Crusades, and there were several of them, we always talk about the first, second, or third, uh, is embedded in Western historiography, embedded in Western textbooks. So it makes an interesting comparison, uh, Dr. Albertini's uh, scholarship, which, which says there's an absence until recently, whereas any school child in the West learned about. And that, that included, I want to make a couple of, of quick points, um, that didn't just include um, the historical events. Uh, I think that the idea of a crusade is baked into European culture. Uh, let's remind ourselves that as horrific as things were in Jerusalem, uh, there was the Albigensian Crusade, which quite possibly in the Middle Ages is the first example of Western genocide, and that was a crusade. I can promise you that no crusader missed a synagogue on the way to Jerusalem and was quite capable of burning them. And when we look historically, we can see the concept of crusade in a couple of ways, which almost seem to us antithetical, but in fact are combined under this impulse, not just for conquest, but for purification. So the new imperialism in Africa in the 1880s was in part justified as a crusade against Muslim slave owners. And it was depicted like that in, in engraving. The crusade against slavery, uh, the crusade of the invasion of, of the Soviet Union by the Nazis was a fascist crusade. And you can see the significance of religion and race in that. I think as all the old folks would say, including myself, uh, if there's smoke, there's probably a fire. And I think that the Americans have inherited uh, an obsession with Jerusalem. It's where Lincoln wanted to go before John Wilkes Booth put the bullet in his head. He and his wife were gonna go to Jerusalem. It's where General Grant went. Americans went on a, what we would call the Levant or Near East. Today we call it the Middle East. That's just because we're more conscious of Japan and China. Um, and I think it's, it's hard to exclude from American foreign policy, and I don't mean this in a partisan way, okay? The idea of evangelical Christianity in which the Middle East, Jerusalem will once again be saved, and clearly the rhetoric against um, particularly Saddam Hussein, and you're, the viewers know I'm no fan of Saddam Hussein, uh, but that was a, Crusade, and you look at the language, 
the US was not gonna go alone, it was gonna be a crusade of the West. So I think we can have a really helpful conversation that the concept of crusade is baked into Western society and it has been present. You can just think about uh, uh, Richard the Lionhearted and all of the epic folklore about his being ransoming, uh, Roland and the crusade against uh, Muslim Moors in order to save. Crusade is just a commonly term, a common use. What I'd ask the reviewers to think about, the listeners, is it's often used with the little C. All right, so the <laughs> crusade. Yeah, a, lot, a lot of crusades right, happen. Right, the crusades are what uh, Tamara has been talking about. But the a implication crusade. of crusade is yeah. aggression. It's aggression. But it's I more am than aggression. to invade your land. But it's, it's more than that. It's this impulse for purity, right? So it's the impulse that I will invade, I will conquer. But look, you can invade and conquer and just make money. That's sensible, okay? You could invade and conquer and purge. And that's really what crusades are about. They're about purging and the pursuit of purity. And so whenever we see in the West really a drive for purity, it is often uh, articulated as a crusade with a little C. Well, so me, I would say me, we have a really fruitful... To, I'm sorry, go ahead. Tamara for a minute. You know, it, it just seems from this discussion, from what you've said, what Peter says, that the Crusades went from west to east. They went from Europe to the Middle East. Uh, and I wonder why it was only one direction. I mean, these were the, the plates of civilization, as somebody called it that, you know. That but, it, but it did go in different directions. Remember, uh, is, Islamic Muslim troops were only finally defeated outside of Vienna in the 1690s. This is okay. Well, I, w- I want to hear this about is, this that. Is out, this is so out. Was this, was this something that was generated in the Middle East, or was it a response to the Crusades that had come from Europe, Tamara? I, I don't think the Ottoman Empire, which was you know the one that got more and more of the Eastern European territories, mostly the Balkans, they were there for 500 years. Let's not forget. And then yes, and they reached they reached Vienna, right? Um, I don't. I'm not aware. Let me put it this way: from my readings that that was a response to the Crusades. I think that was an an imperial move. Um, They they were successful. They, you know, the the prize was of course Constantinople. And once Constantinople fell to the Ottomans, so like every other empire, they kept expanding, right? I I think that's just Mm -hmm. in the nature of of an imperial power. And and also I would say you'd, you'd have to look at uh, the different attitudes towards state religion. And the Ottomans did wrestle with some kind of concept of hierarchical tolerance. So the Ottoman, where the Ottomans went, they were not conquistadors. <laughs> uh, and the Ottoman Empire was what we call a multicultural empire, where, and this is not to whitewash the Ottomans by any means at all, but it was in their interest not to destroy other communities, but to use them, to exploit them and have different, for example, taxation codes. Mm -hmm. That's quite different. And that's not a crusade. That's as Tamara says, that's empire. We might even say just state building because I'm not sure the word empire would have had much meaning, but it's definitely state building or state expansion. But the West, right? That's not part of the Western expansion. Where the conquistadors went, Christianity went, and you either became a Christian or let's not discuss what happened to you. And I, I don't <laughs> think that was, now this is not to say, right, that the Ottomans were good guys all the time. Nobody's gonna say that. And obviously you could say that the genocide towards Armenians, but that's not the Ottoman, that's the Turkish Republic. That has a kind of purification to it, right? I'm going to destroy an entire community, all right? But otherwise that's not baked in to Ottoman history. Conquest is. But like baked into Spanish history is a crusade. And let's remember just one final point that the troops that went off to the Americas in the 16th century were precisely the troops that had just finished the Reconquista, the reconquest of Spain, which was a crusade within Europe, which resulted in, as everybody knows, not just uh, the defeat and expulsion of uh, Moors and Muslims, but also the expulsion of the Jews. That was a crusade. And you can't separate that from the Inquisition. 
Okay, I, I want to I want to go to one question that came in from one of our viewers, and I think it's really worth exploring. You know, from this discussion, uh, to a certain extent, uh, uh, the Muslims then and now think of the of the West. It's an East-West, you know, contention as neo crusaders. Whether it's a, an accurate definition or not. As what I'm sorry, so neo crusade. I'm sorry. What neo, you neo neo crusade. Neo crusade. Sorry, just in here. Sorry. So Tamara, you know, learning from all of that, learning from what you've said, what Peter has said, um, how can the West in general, Europe, the U.S., especially the U.S., um, dispel the image and bridge the gap and make for a more peaceful world, given this historic contention? between the East and West. We, we know so much about what happened, you know, historically, philosophically, religious wise. Uh, what can we pull out of that? What lessons can we pull out of that to use, I don't wanna use foreign policy, but to use in our, our embrace or our dealing um, with the Middle East now? You know, one answer that I have for you or for your viewer is that we are obviously so obsessed with maps that once borders show on maps, we take them to be final and we take maps to indicate um, not just uh, you know, where a country begins or ends, but where cultures begin and end. And that is actually rather unusual considering the last, let's say 2000 years. Because in all that period, pre-Roman, Roman, and beyond, borders were always shifting. And let's say you were within the Roman Empire, that um, didn't say much about you as the individual. You could be of any um, race, ethnicity, or religion. You, you were a citizen, but you know, your culture was defined in very different ways. You could go to the public bath and go to the to the arena and watch the gladiators, right? But you could still be a Zoroastrian or wh whatever religion you, know, you were following. But it is indeed the case that with the rise of Christianity, um, so being in Europe meant you had to be a Christian. And, and that is a trend that we see to these days. I'm a Christian myself. I'm never going to say Christians out of anywhere, but um, we should stop saying, well, if you're not a Christian, then you cannot be in this territory. If you look at, um, let's say, uh, you, you mentioned Spain. If you look at the south of Spain, Andalusia, that was Islamic for almost 800 years, and the territories in North Africa, that was one world. The continental divide was not there. You, so you could, be, you could think of yourself as an Andalusian living in North Africa. You, you were a North African living in Andalusia. Andalusia. You could be an Amazigh, so the original population of, of North Africa. Morocco in its constitution says explicitly that it is the kingdom of, uh, of Andalusians as well, right? So this, this, um, this notion that you know, your borders define exactly who you are is, is, is a big problem. And it has to do with, uh, with, our, you know, with uh, this 19th century obsession about maps. And you know, then the, I mentioned the, uh, the Cyclops-Picot map that created countries that never existed before, regardless of uh, how the communities were built and how they related uh, to other communities hundreds of kilometers away and so forth, right? So you, you put new borders and basically you think you are creating new nations and you change minds. And to some extent you do, but it, it all happened without the agreement of the people who live there. Um, it happened in Europe too, let's face it, you know, when the Austro-Hungarian empire collapsed, I mean, there were dozens and dozens of new countries, new nations. And the big problem was like, okay, so what do we do? I mean, are we going to have only Czechs, right? In what became Czechoslovakia? Oh, they're also Slovaks, they're Hungarians, they're Romanians. What are these people doing in there? Why are they there? And the, and the Slavs, they shouldn't be living in, let's say in Hungary, they should go somewhere where the majority is, is uh, you know, speaks a Slavic language. So you see all these problems with our, with our obsessions with borders, and, and that, that borders define who you are. Uh, I think it was a much happier thing to live in the Austrian-Hungarian Empire 
<laughs> be, be, because these people were, were getting along. My grandmother was born a citizen of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And I know from her that in her generation, everybody was multilingual and everybody went to everyone's community. We've lost that. We, we think of history being, you know, pro progressing, you know, there's a linear way. So to what, what should we focus on, Tamara, in terms of um, having people stop thinking in the terms of uh, crusaders and having them divide on borders, having them divide on religions? How can we soften all of this? Because it is, as Peter says, it's baked in. Um, how can we un, unbake it now in hopefully a more enlightened time? Well, frankly, you know, just to add to what Peter said, um, we should just stop using the word crusade as a metaphor for anything. Um, I, I may get some people angry here, but, you know, when I first came to the United States is when I saw a poster. I was at, I was, uh, at the UCLA first, and it said Campus Crusade. I had no idea what it was. I looked at it, and, you know, thinking, what? What is a Campus Crusade? And you know, somebody explained it to me. And I thought that was a very strange language. I mean, you want to attract people to your church. Okay, you know, but you want to call it a crusade because crusade has all of that brutality, mm -hmm. right? And it's, 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 the connotations are rather atrocious, right? So I, I, I think we should, it doesn't take care of the big problems, but a good step in the right direction is for us to just stop before that word crusade, you know, comes to our minds and we want to use it, of course, metaphorically, we're not thinking of knights and shields and whatever, but the very word is so loaded. And, and I think many people in Western countries just don't realize it. Well, how I about think, the Eastern countries? What, what would you suggest to soften uh, their view of it? Um, not to consider this a crusade or a neo crusade, um, to take that out of the, the conversation. How, how do we do that? How do we in the Western side um, affect that change in the Eastern side? Well, you know, fairness and partnership is the way to go. Um, whether it's, you know, business relationships, whether it's educational uh, exchanges, whether it's artistic exchanges, um, all of that helps tremendously. Um, you know, when, when for the first time um, musicians from Israel and Palestine met to be playing in the same concert, right? That was an amazing uh, experience. That's when musicians just met each other as musicians. And there were, I saw the documentary, it's, 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 a, it's a beauty to, 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 to watch. Um, when, when they just realized, well, it actually, you know, we all love music, right? And, and we love our instruments and we love getting together and, and the experience that we have and we, we generate something together. They ended up uh, loving each other when the, the Palestinian and the Israeli musicians, you know, had to, you know, uh, go back to their, to their um, own cities. Um, many of them cried. They cried because they, that's when they saw the, you know, a human being first. A human being with with common interests, with a with a shared desire, with a shared love for the arts. Right. So, I, I, what I hear you saying is that sometimes, Peter, you're going to love this. <laughs> sometimes history is not here to help. Absolutely, <laughs> history does the opposite. <laughs> but that's why I would say crusades with a capital C, never with a little C. So Peter, we're we're almost out of time, and I want to offer you the opportunity to to provide your thoughts and also summarize this uh, discussion. All right, let me try to summarize uh, Tamara's very important, insightful contributions. Uh, one is that when we talk about the Crusades, we're really talking about a Western story until very recently. That the idea of the Crusades has not until recently taken much of a role in. Uh, Arabic education or Islamic education, but if I'm hearing her correctly, it has been used recently in the last generation or so, but usually in ways which are, are not necessarily either a correct reading of history or a correct reading of the Quran. So in other words, they're, they're being exploited the way they would be in the West, the concept of a crusade. Um, secondly, that a lot of the work that can be done has to be done at the, the social level. Uh, in other words, we have to begin to take seriously uh, diversity and multiculturalism as a goal in and of itself. And so to the idea of the musicians being together, 
that the complement would be schools in which kids and parents from different groups come together. The point I would like to raise as a question for the next discussion, and I hope you can come back, is um, I hear what you're saying about borders. Uh, and even in the 19th century, the world was conceived as going beyond the nation or the nation state. We haven't gotten there, and I'm not sure that we're going to be able to outpace climate change. So I think what I'd ask, ask us to think about is slightly rephrasing that, recognizing there are borders and recognizing there are national identities. How can we have those as inclusive as possible and not, <coughs> excuse me, not relying on a specific ethnic or religious foundation? In the 1840s, there was the idea of utopian nationalism, and that was a nationalism where, yes, your identity was triumphant, and there was a kind of patriotism, but the things you talked about, about the Austro-Hungarian Empire were, in fact, part of that. The worm in the ointment, though, let's remember, for the Austrian Empire, among other things, is an American concept, and that's ethnic nationalism. That's Woodrow Wilson's little baby, and Jay and I are going to talk about Eastern Europe in two weeks, and one of the worms in Eastern Europe is ethnic. There's, there's nothing from either the hand of God or, as I would say, the hand of science, which says your nation has to be based on ethnicity. But historically, that has been the case. And when you start talking about that, it. sorry? I am coming to your class tomorrow. I'll be there. Okay. Okay. I'll be Can there. I Handsome. Add yeah, please. Just one thing. And, you know, I owe it to a conversation I had with another professor of history, a good colleague of Peter's, um, Fabio Lopez Lazaro. He came to talk to my class and you know, he, he knows a lot about Andalusia and Morocco and so forth. And um, in the conversation, I had the example of a North African sweet, which is called Reba. It, it, it's, it looks a little bit like a cone. And um, when I went to teach Hawaiian students in Seville through the study abroad program, uh, I bought for them classical Andalusian sweets that are very famous, especially around Christmas time. And then I told them, these are North African sweets. <laughs> so it's the Amazigh, you know, that had these sweets first. And then, you know, as uh, Andalusia became Islamic, so they were, uh, you know, taken there. And one of my students had, was of Filipino ancestry. And he looked at me, he said, I swear to God, my grandmother makes these sweets. <laughs> because with the Spaniards, it went to the Philippines. <sighs> so, uh, so in the, con in the conversation with Fabio, we said, well, we should think of uh, cultures in very different ways or of communities in different ways. So let's have the community of the, of the eaters of this kind of sweets. And then he mentioned, of course, you know, the olive producing nations. Yeah, they have so much in common. Right? That's a very different way to look at how communities actually relate. Yeah, sure. And you know what they say, uh, sweets for the sweet. And uh, thank you. I think you're both sweet. Uh, may I say that? Tamara Albertini, <laughs> Peter you, you may, not, Berg. you may not say that, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> really appreciate your coming today. Aloha. Thank you, thank you, thank you so thank much. Thank you, Aloha. Thank you very My much. My pleasure. My pleasure. <laughs>